I got my pruners, I got my pruning saw, Ryan. I got my tools ready for spring. And we'll help you get ready for spring next on Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. It has been a crazy weather week. We've gone from 75 degree weather to snow. Now, coming up later in the show, we'll be talking to Jan McNeilan about what we're supposed to be doing in our garden right now. But first, we want to thank everyone that came out to Garden Palooza. It was a great day of plants and old friends. Also coming up in the show today, we'll show you a great place to go view some beautiful magnolias. We'll also show you some dwarf conifers. But coming up first, we're talking strawberries. I'm out here at Al's in Gresham and I'm with Jonathan. Jonathan, it's not too early to start thinking about strawberries. No, no, it really isn't. Uh, uh, this is a great time to get your strawberries into the ground. Um, it's, uh, the, the weather's still nice and mild uh, and, and the berries are gonna uh, love to be put in the ground right now. You know, when we're out shopping for strawberries, there are a lot of different varieties mm -hmm. that are out there. And we hear terms like, you know, June bearing mm -hmm. and ever bearing. What, yeah. what is the difference between those? So your June bearing strawberries are going to give you one major crop in the month of June, generally. Um, your ever bearing are going to give you that June crop, but they're going to give you a secondary crop either in July or in August. It won't be as large as the first crop, but you will get more total berries. Okay. I will say that the June bearing uh, uh, strawberries are going to be a larger berry okay. and by and large they're going to be a little bit of a sweeter berry. Um, they just won't give you the same volume. Uh, and we have actually some June bearing strawberries here, Hood, uh, Benton, and Shuxon. Uh, they all are June bearing. Uh, the other ones here at the end uh, are Seascape and Sweet Anne and they're going to be your uh, ever-bearing strawberries. Okay. Yeah. And then we also have, you know, you'll see strawberries, you know, and other varieties too that, you know, like down at the end, like the Chilowensis and the Virginianas. Yeah. Are those a fruiting strawberry also? They're more ornamental. They're going yeah. to, they're going to do a great job uh, uh, covering ground. Uh, they can uh, help with uh, soil erosion on slopes actually, because they'll send the, the runners out just like our, our other strawberries here and they'll, help keep that soil in place. But it's not the big juicy red nope, berry that we're using. It is to. not. So it's more of an ornamental. Yeah. So if you're wanting the fruiting ones, we'll stick, stick with the other berries. Right over here, yep. So you know, after we pick out a, a plant or the berry that we like, or we can mix and do different varieties, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do we care for them? What, what do we need to do for, for like our soils and fertilizers? And Yeah, that? so they're gonna want a, a light, well-drained soil. Um, and as far as the fertilizer goes, something that's going to uh, be designed with acidic loving plants in mind mm -hmm. is definitely going to uh, make them and keep them happy. Uh, we, I always recommend a transplant fertilizer when you're first putting them in okay. the ground. Uh, that helps with the initial root growth and really uh, promotes a stronger above ground growth over a short period of time. Uh, the other thing to, to know is that slugs are definitely gonna, gonna come after them. And right. so a, a, a slug bait, especially um, something that's uh, kind of a more organic, family friendly slug bait, is a great thing to have around your strawberries, especially if you have kids or grandkids. That right. Because I usually liked having the first munch out of my berries. Exactly. Berry right in the, the garden. Right, right in the garden. Yep. And so, you know, there's some differences. You know, these are, you know, looks like an individual plant yes. in, in just a four inch pot. But you also have, you know, install these larger plants. Yeah. So, what's, what's the difference between the two there? So, this is actually 10 starts. Uh, okay. So, there are. Uh, actually 10 different plants inside here versus the four inch container just has a single plant. Uh, when you're planting this, you're gonna wanna pull the whole thing out and break off a bunch of your soil. And then you're gonna want to take these individual starts and separate them. I'm just kinda just te teasing those, those apart, I yep. see that. And so the strawberries, they don't necessarily just have to be planted in the ground. So you have this, this container here, which is right. conveniently named a strawberry pot. <laughs> <laughs> right. But these are great, great for this because the pockets are so small that you can get these roots, yeah. roots down in there. So these you can 
put a little more soil in yeah, there. I'll let you plant. I'll grab, grab some soil for you there. You can just drop these right down in there. And so then you're just pot putting one in, one in each hole. Yep. And so then you, you have your good, good soil here. And then once you have this, this potted up, you know, you're, are you using your transplant fertilizers on, on these as well? So the transplant fertilizer, yeah, and we've already actually used it. We've, we've mixed it into our base soil here okay. so that it's down on the root line. It's down with the roots and not sitting on top like a lot of the, uh, the slow-release fertilizers okay. that you see are. Uh, and and that, that transplant fertilizer is, is really specifically designed for uh, the promotion of, of root growth. Okay. Um, so that's already mixed in, and then we just, yep, just keep, 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 layering keep on like that, going, yeah. yep. And then I've seen, you know, people putting, you know, strawberries in hanging baskets. Yeah, that absolutely. another option, too. Yeah, you really can. Um, they're they're going to grow, and they're going to send out their little, their little runners that they send, right. and uh, anywhere that those runners are, are going to encounter soil, whether it's coming off of a pot or uh, down the side of a, a planter or a, or a wall, they're going to root in and you're going to get more, uh, more strawberry plants the next year. Awesome. You know, so there's, you know, so many great varieties out there. You know, I love to kind of mi mix and match and do a lot of, you know, some June bearing and some mm -hmm. ever bearing. So if you're looking to harvest some strawberries in your yard this summer, make sure you come out to Al's, you know, their four stores, you know, and talk to Jonathan and their staff and come pick out and try some new varieties. You know, you get all the supplies with it, pick up a pot, put them in the ground. You know, the options are endless. So Jonathan, I appreciate being out here today and showing us what we can do with our strawberry plants. Absolutely, my pleasure. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. At Sagawa Nursery, we always talk about taking your garden from ordinary to extraordinary. For us, that means bringing you the newest and best plants and unique garden items to you, our customer. For you, that means we'll help you transform your garden into something that's extraordinary. We also have some great gift items and even a few surprises for inside your home, too. Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. in our gardens we like to work smart because we're doing a lot of activities well I have some new tools that we're going to make your work so much easier I'm with Wayne from Steel Tools and so Wayne we love coming because we love gadgets I think gardeners are gadget people too so tell us about some of the things that will make our lives so much easier in our gardens well among those is the combi system for all the different tools that you need for maintaining your yard and your garden um, edgers line trimmers, hedge clippers, blowers, all these different tools are in the combi system. And we've had this for 20 years. And these are old tools that I've had that long. But just recently, we have came out with some battery powered power heads for them. Ah. And this is one of those. The battery drops in and away you go. It's quiet, it's as powerful as the gas. And you really can just do a lot of work on one charge of that battery. That is nice. And so explain a little bit about the combi because we have some new gardeners here. And so really you get like one piece that works with so many tools. So you don't have to have a lot of heavy things. You just kind of interchange them all. Well, that's it. You don't have to have 10 engines ten. to have 10 tools. Mm. You just have one power head that could be gas or that might be battery. And 
that's all you have to maintain. Cool. And that's always where the maintenance is, is in the engine or the power supply. Mm -hmm. So it's a super good idea and it also condenses into a smaller package if you have limited space in your garage or wherever you store your tools. That is so true because of space. That's always the other thing too. And it, that might be, I, don't, I can't get that tool because I don't have the space. But that's really right. that solves another problem there. It does, it does. It makes space so you can have more of something else. Right, right. <laughs> and then we need to talk safety because they are power tools. You're that's not just right. using a trowel. So what do you um, expect us to do for that? Well, anytime you're using tools, it's really a good idea to have eye protection and hearing protection. And uh, I always say gloves are good, long pants, boots. Don't think that because it's a uh, line trimmer and it's safe and go out there with your flip-flops on. That's not a good idea. That's true. And because we want to be able to enjoy our gardens too. That's right. Not be injured. That's right. That's true. Well, you know, um, steel tools are in many places around the area. And so where can we find the dealers? If you just uh, Google steel and your town, you'll find out where your dealer is. And um, they'll be happy to help you. Definitely. Really good knowledge there too. At there. So if you can go to gardentime.tv, we'll click you over to that website and you can go to the steel dealers and get some of these tools for your garden for this year. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, it's one of those things that many of us have, nobody wants. Today I'm with Tom Combs and we're talking moles today, Tom. Tom, we have a lot of these in our yard. I know I get them. How do we get rid of them? Um, well, uh, many different ways. Um, um, we have a product called Molemax from Bonide, um, and it's not just for moles, it's also a repellent for voles and gophers. Okay. So three common rodents that we have in the area. Um, the first thing I want to point out is this is an all natural product. It's granular, so it, it will shake out. Nice. Um, the best way to apply it is through a spreader, whether it's a drop spreader or a broadcast spreader. This is a five pound canister. It will treat up to 2,500 square feet. Oh, for, wow. for relatively small areas, that's a good size. Um, the value is in the 10 pound and the 40 pound for large areas. Uh, and that's kind of what we have here today. Right, because we're, we're out here, you know, there's there's definitely evidence there's, there's a lot of mole <laughs> yeah. work, work in this, this area. Yeah, we have a lot of mole activity here. Some of this is from um, previous months, but you can see we have some fresh activity. Right. Um, so Molemax is the product, it's all natural. It's just a deterrent, it's, it's, it's not toxic. Um, so it's safe for our kids, it's safe for us, it's safe for our pets. But there is a couple steps that's important to know on how to apply it. Okay. So one, you're gonna to wanna to flatten all of the fresh mole hills. Okay. And then water that area, and in the next three to five days, they'll start to pop up. So now we've identified in this large space, we've identified where they're actually at. Okay. Because okay? we want that active area where they're, where they're working. Active is the key word, okay? So they're actively feeding on grubs and earthworms in the area. So we flattened it, wait three to five days, they'll pop up. Now we've identified where they're at, okay? So the other thing I like to do is take this space and cut it into half, okay? okay? So we've identified where they're at, cut the space in half, and then start to apply Molemax and immediately water it in. Okay, and so that's gonna soak that down, dissolves it down into the ground, is that? Exactly, by watering it or doing it before Mother Nature wants to water, we're gonna get Molemax down to the grubs and the earthworms. We're gonna coat those grubs and earthworms. That's their food source. Okay. And when the mole and the vole and gopher come and eat that food source, it gives them a stomach ache. It also deters on taste. Um, so especially moles, they're kind of like cats. They self-clean. And when they lick their fur, they'll pick up Molemax. They don't like that bitter taste. So stomach irritant and taste, and then they will leave the area. Okay. Now, if we blanket treat the whole area, we're going to trap them. So that's why oh. I say cut it in half, treat one area, and move them left, right, up, and down. Gotcha. Which is, which is a good plan because then you're, you're pushing them where you don't want them. Exactly. Maybe the neighbor you don't like, <laughs> so, right? Okay. So just saying. Okay. You know. So you're you know you're talking. You know, this is a natural, and you can tell by the little uh, banner up on the top of the packaging there, which is Bonite is great for always you know 
recommending that product. You know. Absolutely. And then for people that want to get this, it's pretty readily available, right? Yeah, uh, Bonide products are, are found at most retail garden centers. Uh, but I always say go to the website, www.bonide.com. We have a dealer locator and just identify the nearest retail store in, in your neighborhood. Great. You know, so it's gr great information. You know, a lot of us are used to setting some, you know, bulky traps, which are, can be really, really hard to do. But, you know, Momax is a very simple product, you know, to display and put out. Absolutely. Easy to apply, covers a big area, non-toxic, uh, simply a deterrent. You know, so for more information on Molmax and where to go find it, make sure you go to Bonide's website or you can go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over. So, Tom, thanks for all the information and hopefully we'll go catch some more. All right. <laughs>
and uh, they were responsible for a lot of introductions of magnolias um, from China into cultivation in England. And oh, interesting. And then what's the next section of the next um, species of magnolias at Bloom? So we kind of move um, into some of the sort of more evergreen uh, magnolias. So there's a big section of the magnolias that used to be called Michaelias, um, mm. but they're all kind of lumped in with magnolias now. Um, and they will start blooming. Um, a lot of times the flowers maybe aren't as big and spectacular, but sometimes different colors and they last a little bit longer. And then later in the year, we'll get into some of the, like the um, American species of magnolias, like uh, this uh, leaf That's is huge. from uh, Magnolia macrophyllum, which is a big leaf magnolia. And uh, it blooms kind of in about uh, sort of early to midsummer for us. And it actually has a flower that's about over 12, maybe up to 18 inches broad. Wow. It's a massive flower to go with these really big leaves. Wow, and that's just a tease to come back to see that. But we're gonna go to a specific magnolia to see, and it's just on this path, so let's go walk over. Yeah, let's go check it out. Martin, it's been really fun to walk among them all, but this one is spectacular. Yeah, this is one that, um, because we just kind of got the timing right to be out here, this is Magnolia sargentiana var robusta. And um, this species um, it doesn't flower for a particularly long time. If we get a year where the weather is a little bit too cold, sometimes the, the buds will freeze, and so we don't get any flowers. <laughs> Um, so mild winters are really good, and, and this year it has a, a really amazing amount of flowers on it. Um, the flowers are, are, as you can see, really big. I mean, they're sort of 8 to 10 inches and um, have this little bit of a pink blush to them. And one of the, the things that I love about it is the petals are kind of relaxed and sort of fold back, um, which is a little bit different from some of the Solangiana types where the flower is much more upright and much more rigid. Um, and so people describe it as like, uh, like a dove sort of Aww. sitting in a tree with its wings kind of down. So um, yeah, it just evokes a lot, of, a lot of feeling from people. They enjoy the way it looks. Oh, it is beautiful. And really for some of the cultivars that are out in the market in the garden centers, they're nice trees for homeowners. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of smaller statured magnolias. Some of them tend to get very large than the Solangiana types um, uh, that are sort of popular for the early bloom. Um, but yeah, if you look around, you'll find there's some really nice evergreen um, locally. Um, Magnolia modiae um, is really widely used even as a street tree. It's pretty good. Oh. Uh, Magnolia galaxy is another great street tree type we see um, used all around Portland and they're actually in bloom um, around Portland streets right now. They oh. really brighten things up. So. It is. Um, yeah, I mean, magnolias are pretty versatile. The, the one thing that we really want to be cautious about them is they don't really like to dry out very much and they like a lot of mulch over the root system. So, and then um, I would say the other thing is, is post-bloom pruning. So don't put off your pruning till the fall. We wanna prune them right after they flower so that they have time to set new buds for next year. Uh, really, that's all great tips about them. And magnolias are so beautiful for your garden, but come on out to Hoyt and really see this collection this spring. And you have time to do it. It's not gonna be just right now this minute, but you'll see that whole progression of magnolia blooms. If you have any other questions, please go to gardentime.tv and we, you can click over to the Hoyt Arboretum website too. Martin, thanks so much. Happy spring. Happy spring. While many of us are still enjoying our tulips and our daffodils this spring, it's not too early to start thinking about our summer bulbs. Actually, now is the time that we want to plant them. Today we're going to be planting some gladiolas. You know, this would be also the time we want to plant some calla lilies or some dahlias. And so what we want to do is we're going to dig a, dig a small little hole. We'll read the directions on the package with how deep we want to go. These are going to be about four to five inches deep. So we'll dig our hole. We want to make sure that we have good drainage. And then we'll take our bulbs. You know, the easy thing about these, you just kind of drop, drop them in the hole and just place them right in there. Sometimes it's kind of hard because we don't know what the top or the bottom of the bulb might be. So when in doubt, you can either just plant it on its side or just throw it in. The bulbs are pretty resilient and they're going to find their way up to the top. So once we have our bulbs planted in there, we're just going to sprinkle the soil right over the top. Like that plant them down in there and then we can take and we want to mark them so in case we're doing some digging later this year before they start coming up you can use like an old fork or you know a nursery tag or sometimes it's even fun just to take a rock and write the name right on there so we'll mark our bulbs we'll water them in and we'll get to enjoy them the rest of the summer
Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Color, color, color. When you think of your garden, think of color. Then think of Margie's Farm and Garden. High quality plants and great customer service are our trademark. Are you in need of a bit of shade? Maybe some tasty fruit? Then you need a tree or shrub. This weekend, we have a wide assortment of trees and shrubs on sale at 20% off. Vegetables or herbs, hanging baskets or perennials, trust Margie's Farm and Garden, just off I-5 near Aurora. To celebrate a spring tradition, visit the Holda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holda's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Since 1987, French Prairie Gardens has brought you the best in farm fresh produce, beautiful plants and memorable family events. Spring is here and now is the time to get your garden ready with our wide selection of bedding plants and hanging baskets. Experience the best the country has to offer at French Prairie Gardens. I'm with Jan McNeilan today, and so Jan, we are so sorry about Ducky. So, you know, she was such an integral part when we came to visit you every month. Yep, she was an old kitty. She'd been 19 and this summer, but, um, She's an amazing companion for me, and I put it on my Facebook page. Not that everybody posts about their animals, uh, but she became a star on uh, Garden Time, so I let people know. Yeah, we just loved having her because she was just, it, it wasn't a shoot unless Ducky was in it, yeah, photobombing. It, we, I think we've actually gotten calls like we haven't seen Ducky in a couple right, of times. Right, right, so, oh, yeah. yeah. So, and then also we have to talk about this last week was it's pretty crazy. crazy. I That's mean, the why snow. We're in front of the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, because we're not going to be outside because there's snow out there today. So. <laughs> so, you know, we all experienced this. And so, what, what is the difference between snow and frost? Because frost can happen all the way through May. Sure. Uh, frost is really more damaging than the snow is. And I, and I know people worry about their snow on my plants and my bulbs and my, I've seen uh, daffodils in solid ice that were blooming and really gorgeous, <laughs> but um, uh, they melt and still fine. I mean, it's not like it kills them. Ah. Frost can kill the tender new growth on plants, but actually snow is an insulator. Ah. So it actually is better to have snow than frost. So really the thing to take away from this is to watch the weather and kind of know that these things can occur because that frost date or when it's really safe is an average. Yes, yes. And there's a lot of different plants that handle frost just fine. Just that the, I guess the lesson is to just don't uncover mulches and things until the, the soil really does start to warm up because then you will get some damage on the tender growth that's under your mulch. Uh, and really the soil will warm up a lot later than the air temperature. Absolutely, and uh, that's why I always say that a soil thermometer is like one of the best things you can right, do. Right. And then I think, I've said it before, but I've got a, a bunch of seed packets here, and I always, when I get them, I write down on the front of the package what the soil temperature is for germination. Mm. So before I seed these things, I need to look at the soil temp and if it's not there yet, you're gonna, your seeds are just gonna rot. Yeah, that or is true. just freeze. Uh, so what can we do this time of year? Because we're kind of in the in-between. Well, we've had some nice days that get you out there to do more than you ought to be. <laughs> but I got some new strawberries. My strawberry bed didn't look very good. So I cleaned out all the old stuff and then there was plenty of room for 
for some new varieties. I got some hoods and I got oh. some, sea, well, I have some seascapes already. Um, I have uh, quinaults that are an everbearing. And so that was fun. And they're in and they're fine and they look fine and the snow isn't gonna hurt them any. Uh -huh. The only other thing I've planted out in the beds is lettuce at this point. And then I've planted peas. And those should all be fine, or yep. else seed isn't that expensive, so really try again. Right. Well, the thing of it is, too, is like peas, you can put those in in January or February, and even potatoes. So there's a lot of things you can do safely. Yeah. And to go to that OSU website, because I think it has so much good information on sure, it. Sure, sure. The Extension Publications or Master Gardener or Ask an Expert. Yeah. And that link will be on the Garden Time website because we really love that information. And it's all there for you. Mm -hmm. I, it's really great. Or go to your independent garden center, talk sure. to them. Um, because there still are things that we can be doing this time of year, um, even if the weather's just a little bit too chilly. Well, at Garden Palooza, I was asked a number of times how the lemon was doing. <laughs> and. Uh, not well Aww. at this. I'm glad we're not in the greenhouse yeah, today <laughs> because then you would have to see. Uh, the leaves dropped off and I think it got, I've been heating the greenhouse this year, but I think it got cold for that. It's still alive. It's fine. I'll drag it out of there and uh, uh, prune it back and uh, fertilize and it'll be back. It'll and because it, okay. it's not dead. It's just um, a little bump in the road. Right. And the angel trumpet the, uh, that I had, the Brugmansia, Instead of leaving it outside this year, I pulled it in the greenhouse. And right now, in April, it has 19 big buds on it. Uh, so Jan, you mentioned fertilizer. So should we be fertilizing things in our garden? Not during this cold weather. It, it, it won't absorb it anyway. The soil temperature has to be enough for a plant to bring it in. Uh, but, and, and I wouldn't think that uh, doing any pruning right now is gonna help you at all. I would wait until you see some new growth buds on it. If there is any damage, you can prune back to new growth. But other than that, uh, no, not time yet. Yeah. It will be, it will be. I think weeding is a good time to do that. Sure. Always a good time. Sure. I pulled a lot of chickweed the other day. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah, it, you can, uh, there's always something to do. Of course, of but course. But then if you've got a fireplace, <laughs> just get a good book. <laughs> That's true. Jan, thanks for those tips. You know, every month you just give us all those great words of wisdom. Well, thank you. Uh, gardening is an experiment and every year is different. Even though you think you've got it, uh, <laughs> just do a lot of observation and enjoy your garden and don't get too overzealous about doing something because it's been cold. Uh, well, you know, Jan has all those great words for us every month. So if you have any other questions, please go to gardentime.tv. We can click you to all the websites, but we'll see Jan next month. Thanks. <laughs>well, it's not too early to start thinking about our summer picnics and our barbecues, and it's time to actually get out our wasp or yellow jacket and hornet traps. Now's the time of the year where the queens are coming out, and we want to set our traps out now to catch them before they nest somewhere else. So you can take a trip out to your independent garden center and get that whole kit of a trap and the attractants. Or if you have a trap from last year, you just need new attractant. So there is attractant just for wasp, hornet, and yellow jackets, or specifically for yellow jackets. And make sure that you do replenish it every few weeks to make sure that you're getting them all trapped. So start now for a pest-free summer. Since 1982, The Wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, The Wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Find everything you need for spring at Al's Garden and Home. Create a beautiful living space both inside and out with the help of Terra Casa. 
Outside, you'll find pottery, fountains, and decor to make your garden unforgettable. And inside, there are home furnishings and just the right accents to make your home warm, inviting, and most importantly, comfortable. Terra Casa has a huge selection of merchandise to fit any home or budget. Plus, we still have all the unique and distinctive gifts that you have come to expect from Terra Casa. Terra Casa in downtown Damascus. Join Garden Time as we hit the road again. In September of 2022, we'll travel to Holland and Belgium. We'll visit the world-famous Allsmere Flower Auction, Flora World, the University Gardens of Ghent, and the Japanese Gardens of The Hague. We'll also visit the once-a-decade Floriade Expo, the World's Fair of Gardening. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Ghent, The Hague, and Amsterdam on this wonderful tour. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. I think when we all think about orchids, we think about rainforests and tropical oases. Well, I'm actually in greenhouses with Lori, who is a member of the Oregon Orchid Society, who has kind of gone overboard, but <laughs> it's a wonderful hobby. Thank you very much. My husband says I could have worse addictions. <laughs> That's so true. But thank you for coming and seeing my flowers. Well, you know, she has just so much experience, and she's going to pass on all those tips to us. So we're going to talk about all these beautiful species and um, orchids that we have here sitting in front of us. Well, I tried to get a selection of orchids and things that we can grow in our homes without oh, sure. necessarily having to have an, a greenhouse and mm, the elaboration true. of that. So I've selected some easy growing phalaenopsis, Beautiful. which this little section is different, different kinds of phalaenopsis here. So we've got some stripes, we've got some color splashes here. And then I've also selected pass. Pathiopetalums are actually also referred to as the lady slipper Those orchid. Are beautiful. So we have some really, really interesting pathiopetalums. So unusual. The color range from the two tone, and then there's a burgundy, the yellow. Now, these two, how would you take care of them in our homes? They basically can live in a 70 degree temperature. Mm. Morning sun is nice. Um, it uh, really is important for you to find the right location okay. in your house. And again, if you if you find it and would create some humidity in next to your sink, um, in your kitchen, in your bathrooms, mm -hmm. these are really nice places to put them. They don't necessarily like direct sun, okay, but they do like to have like an a, a, an offset of some sunshine. Watering once a week, easy, and stuff that they really are rewarding and they're really not difficult to grow at all. Well, you know, I've had one blooming, I think, for at least four months. Nice. And the flowers are just great. And it is even kind of adding some more buds to it. So nice. it, the stem's even elongating even more. It seems like you're ha it's in a happy place. It's very happy. Very, very good. A lot of people overwater their orchids, too. So really watch the watering okay. once a week or so and kind of keep an eye out, but let it dry out in between its waterings. I played around a little bit here with a mounted orchid. So that's, that's kind, kind of, of fun. Sure. Oh, um, some cork, and that's and it's just so requires a little misting every day. Oh, very easy. And then we can move over here to some paths, paphia petalums, with mm -hmm. again some more lady slipper orchids in different colors. Now what's this one with the long foliage? That's a cymbidium, often Beautiful. referred to as the corsage oh, orchid. Sure, sure. And again, this one has four spikes on it and oh, it seems to be pretty beautiful. happy. Another one here. And then right here we have a cattleya. Beautiful and uh, cattleyas are something that I've recently gotten interested in and, and tried to uh, get a little bit better at growing them. They are a little bit of a challenge, but also, like sun, can live in the house, but are very, very, very rewarding. Well, I know with these um, cymbidiums, I did notice that outside of the greenhouse, you have a whole stand of them with some shade cloth on them. So they're outside. It's kind of early in the season. I bring them out at, after the last possibility of some frost. Mm -hmm. They really don't like to have a frost after they've been in the greenhouse. Sure. So I bring them out in about now and uh, let them stay out all the way until October okay. or the first of November. They like the temperature change. Oh, okay. And then the flowers will come in the winter time? Does it spike? They after start you bring to them spike in? when you bring them in. Uh, they're heavy fertilizers, so okay. give them a little osmocote or some fertilizer. And uh, all these varieties we can uh, see more and more at s several of our shows. The oh. Oregon Orchid Society puts on several shows uh, in the spring and in the fall, and there are 30,000 species of orchids, and that would be a wonderful opportunity if people wanted to come and see more of the, <laughs> of the kinds of orchids. Uh, so if you want to feed your addiction about orchids or learn anything else, please go to Gardentime.tv. We'll click you over their website and get so much more information or even stop at one of their shows or their meetings. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You've really brought so much information for us. Thank you for having me.
Since having my injury, I really wanted to get back to gardening. So we have some tips to help with the mobility in your garden. So for me, I have this great walker that has a seat, so I'm safe and comfortable in the garden. It also helps me reach a raised bed. This is a great one that's at Garden Gallery Ironworks. It's a little taller and just perfect height for this walker. And if you can bend down, make sure to use a kneeler or some knee pads to help with that. And as with any you know, outdoor activities, you want to make sure you're stretched and your muscles are nice and warm to prevent injury. Wearing an apron is also a great idea because you can use it to put your cell phone in in case you do have a fall or an accident. And it's also great to put your garden tools. You know, slipping in the pockets here, it'll save you less trips to the garden shed. And speaking of tools, Jan McNeilan has a great tip for long handled tools. She uses pipe insulation on that handle and then it helps with the grip and it's also less stress on your hands. And if you have one of these grabbers, it is a wonderful tool to have in the garden. It can pick up anything that you've dropped and you don't have to bend over. Some other great tools to look for are ergonomic tools. These are a couple from Fiskars. This one is nice, it's a hand pruner, and these have a rotating handle. So as you're pruning, it takes less stress to close that grip, and it's easier on the hand. This another one is a pair of loppers, and these are nice because they're ratcheting. So as you grab onto it, it slowly ratchets down and takes less energy. And they're also nice because they have orange in the handle. So when you lay them down in the dirt, they're easy to find later. And the last few tips are to take a lot of breaks, change your body position often, and drink lots of water so that you're comfortable in the garden. You know, for more information on accessible gardening or ergonomic tools, go to gardentime.tv. Join Garden Time as we hit the road again. In September of 2022, we'll travel to Holland and Belgium. We'll visit the world-famous Allsmere Flower Auction, Flora World, the University Gardens of Ghent, and the Japanese Gardens of The Hague. We'll also visit the once-a-decade Floriot Expo, the World's Fair of Gardening. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Ghent, The Hague, and Amsterdam on this wonderful tour. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. For 90 years, Espoma has one guiding principle, develop the finest organic gardening products that work in harmony with nature, grow beautiful gardens, and make a greener world for the future. From our soil products to our plant foods, we have always been committed to the environment and sustainability. We use a vast array of natural and organic ingredients and package them in our 100% solar-powered plant. Look for the quality line of Espoma products at your local independent garden center. Espoma, organic from the beginning. Celebrate a spring tradition, visit the Olda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holda's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Garland Nursery, a must-stop destination for those that want to play with plants and grow with their garden. Whether you are a new or a seasoned gardener, Garland Nursery can help fulfill your gardening desires and your landscape needs. From organic veggies, trees and shrubs, to colorful blooms, from the newest trends in garden supplies and garden decor, shop Garland Nursery to find that perfect plant or piece that fills you and your garden with delight. It's always a beautiful day at Garland Nursery. Well, it's springtime, our gardens are awakening, and so are the birds. I'm with Amanda, we're out at Backyard Bird Shop. And Amanda, you know, people that are getting into birding, what do they need to know, or what do they need to have in their gardens? Yeah, thank you for asking. There are a lot of great ways to get started with birding if you're new to, to feeding the birds in your backyard. And there's kind of three main things that we always talk about. You can feed seed, and so you can put up a traditional seed feeder. We've got a variety here, we've got tube feeders, you can put up seed and that'll bring in a wide variety of birds. Suet is a great easy way, I call it kind of the gateway into bird feeding. It's a great way to put out um, food and nutritious food for the birds to bring a wide variety of birds into your yard. And then water. It's so important year round to provide water, fresh water for your birds and you get a wider variety of species visiting your yard with water. Um, for example, you can't bring in a cedar waxwing into your yard with seed, but if you have moving water, that'll do oh, the trick. So, and then, you know, in that note, we want to kind of make sure that, you know, when you're putting this out, you want to make sure it's clean, right? It's so important to feed responsibly. 
If you're not going to feed responsibly, then don't do it. It's okay. The birds will survive without you. But if you're going to do it, it's so important to keep your feeders clean. And so um, on our website, we have a lot of information on how to clean feeders. And so you, we've got bottle brushes that you can use for your tube feeders using a 10% Clorox or 10% bleach solution to clean them and then let them completely dry. Rinse them thoroughly and let them completely dry before you re-add your seed. And that's so important to just keep the birds healthy so they're not spread disease between each other. Gotcha. You know, and you mentioned the kind of the suet, and you know, a lot of us think of suet as like a wintertime kind of thing to feed, but it's actually not. I think this is the most <laughs> exciting time to feed suet because we've got baby bird season happening, right? right? And so the baby birds love suet. This is full of nutritional um, protein and fats that the baby birds need. And so the parents will be bringing them to the, to the nest to feed them suet in the nest. And then they'll be bringing them to the suet feeder and teaching them how to feed from it. One of my most exciting baby bird stories is watching a northern flicker come and feed their young from the suet and then learning, watching the young learn how to eat from the suet feeder. And it's hilarious to watch because they're as big as the parent birds, but they're very clumsy and awkward. And so that's how you know it's a juvenile. And so it's really fun to watch them try to get on the suet feeder and feed, but it's so fun. And it just really enriches the whole, the whole baby bird season. Right. You know, and a lot of people think that you need like a big yard in order to attract all these birds, but you don't really do. No, absolutely. You don't need a yard really at all. You can have a deck. Um, with hookery and hanging off the deck that you can hang the feeders from. That's what my parents do. They have rich wildlife coming into their yard just with their seed and suet um, hanging off their decks. You can also, we have a fun variety of window feeders that okay. even if you have a big yard, it's a great way to bring in. Um, here's, here's just a glass one that you can fill with sunflower seeds and put it right on your window and they'll come and eat from you. We've got um, hummingbird feeders too. So you don't have to have a big yard to really have a rich environment of birds. Right. And so you can sit inside and enjoy these. Other Absolutely. Things. That's the whole point. Never put a feeder where you can't see it because you're doing it for your personal enjoyment as right. well as their health. Now what other kind of items might we need you know aside from the, the feeders and the food and the water? Well as I said this is nesting season and so it's a great time to go ahead and put up a bird a birdhouse nesting boxes. That's um, just a really pretty one and this one is also locally made so we've got a wide variety of locally made birdhouses, nesting shelves, and I always like to put out nesting material. You don't have to do this. This is just a kind of an added bonus, but if you put out natural animal fibers, um, it's really fun to watch them come gather them up. We um, just a few nights ago, we saw a chickadee with just beetfuls of the, the pygora goat fleece, just filling it up and flying off and then coming back and getting more. And it was entertainment for the whole dinner table. It was really lots right. of fun. And then, you know, once we get these birds to our yard, you know, we might not know what they are, but you have definitely have a way that you can help identify those. So my favorite way is these posters. This is kind of a good starter kit to learn how to identify the most common birds we find in our backyard. So this kind of has a wide variety of the most common birds found in our backyards. And then once you kind of narrow in and you're like, oh, it does have kind of a beak that looks like this, then you can kind of do a little bit more research and figure out the difference between a black headed gross beak and an evening gross beak and it kind of narrow in. My favorite thing to use when I'm traveling is the Merlin Bird ID app. It's free and I put it on my smartphone and wherever I am, I just plug in. You tell it kind of the size and the main colors and it gives you kind of a list of birds and it really helps you narrow in instead of having to carry around a big field guide. Right. Although field guides okay. are great. Well, you know, birding, birding is such a fun activity that you can do with the whole family. You know, if you're just getting into birding or you've been doing it for years, make sure you come down and talk to Amanda down here at Backyard Bird Shop and her and her staff will definitely get you started and be out in the garden with those birds. So thanks, Amanda. It's Thank you so much. Find everything you need for spring at Al's Garden and Home. Since 1929, Grimm's Fuel has powered great gardens around our area. With our comprehensive composting and yard debris services, we can apply quality garden mulch, compost, and blended soils with our experienced crews and trucks, including our landscape rock and bark products as well. 
We are proud of our industry-leading state-of-the-art composting facilities. We also can take care of your fuel oil and firewood needs. Grimm's Fuel, building great gardens since 1929. Judy, what are you doing? You said to follow you. Follow us on Facebook. Oh, man. Well, we invite all of our viewers to follow the Garden Time page on Facebook. And on our Facebook page, you'll find links to stories, you'll see upcoming events, and you also might even find a funny joke or two. So don't forget, go to the GardenTime.tv webpage and click the link for Facebook. Hey everybody, Brian Bauman from Bauman's Farm and Garden. And in general, I'm an impatient person, but this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about a brand new line of products we have at the farm called InstaHedge. Literally, these trees are grown on a farm in Canby where they're grown in a hedge. The company then cuts them out of the ground in the hedge, picks them up, they get delivered to your house within two weeks of them being ordered, and instantly at your house, you have the hedge to block out those neighbors or whatever else you'd like to screen at your home. At the farm, we have several different samples available so you can pick out the perfect one that works for your house. From boxwoods in a shorter size to kind of a medium height, or emerald green arborvitaes and Portuguese laurel. There is everything that you would need to create that instant gratification that all of us are looking for. Come out to the farm, we'll help you pick out the perfect one for your house, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Here at Garden Time, we love to tell you all about how to plant trees and shrubs and perennials in your garden. But there's actually one thing you should do before you actually plant those, is you need to call 811, call before you dig. And so I'm with Eric today from Northwest Natural. And so Eric, why is it so important that we do call? Well, safety is the number one importance on calling. You want to make sure you do not damage or hit any utilities in your property. So when you call 811, which is a national one, one number system, you allow the locators and utilities to come out and accurately locate any utility that's on your property, even outside your property, if that's what you're requesting. Uh, and really, it's also for safety of your neighborhood, too, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. So there's, there's gas lines below ground and also power lines below ground. Those are very hazardous. And so should I call like in a couple of days before or can I call right before I'm going to do my project? So you want to call two business days before you start digging, not more than 10 business days before you start. And then should I tell you exactly where I'm going to be working? Does that help you guys? Yeah, so the, the more accurate you can be with the exact location of where you're digging is, is better. That allows the locators that come to your property and put locate marks down. It allows them to know exactly where you plan to do your digging. And you know, I have really sharp tools. So if you could just kind of explain about the different kind of pipes that you have in your pipe. Your yeah, so I got a couple examples here. Here we got a two inch line. This is what you'd find out in the street distributed to your service line, which is right here, a half inch line. These half inch lines, what you find mostly on property, are very thin. A shovel will go right through that and cause a damage and gas to escape. That is true. So you really want to be safe for yourself and for also your neighbors too. Correct. And then if I do do damage, I'm responsible, aren't I? Yes, they are very expensive damages. There is a, there is a cost involved with that. So not only is it unsafe, there is a cost that goes along with damage and utilities. And you know, April is a very special month here, isn't it? Yes, April is National Dig Safety Month. It's very important to us here, and uh, we just want to make sure everybody gets the word out about calling 811. Yeah, and you know, it is really that easy, and it's free. It doesn't cost you anything to call before you dig, but after, if you do the damage, you are responsible. So please go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to the website, and you can get all that information to be safe. Thanks so much, Eric. Thank you. I'm with Rick at French Prairie Perennials in Aurora. Hi. And you always have such beautiful things. So what are you going to have? This is one of my favorite plants. This is a dwarf blue atlas cedar called Hortzman. So the growth rate is a lot slower than it is on your typical blue atlas cedar. And it's only going to max out you know, between 10 and 12 feet. So it's not going to get huge. Nice. So it's a really great accent for the garden because of the bright blue color. Perfect. And then I always love Japanese umbrella pines. Yeah, this is a dwarf Japanese umbrella pine called Stern, Stern Snoopy, but now it's called Green Star. <laughs> but Green Star is a very columnar, slow growing uh, plant that's going to get, you know, in that six to eight foot range. So it's not a huge plant and it's only going to be, you know, two, three feet wide. So it's not really wide, but 
the thick needle is how you tell Green Star it's from beautiful. every other Japanese umbrella pine. Beautiful texture. And the very dense growth rate is habit is, is, is very nice. And such a nice contrast to this gold plant down here. Absolutely. As you know from our visual escaping projects, contrast is really big for mm -hmm. us. And this is a dwarf uh, Suara cypress called Harvard Gold. I really like it because it has a very even growth habit, very slow growth habit. So it looks like you've spent hours pruning it and manicuring <laughs> it. But So you can take all the credit, but you don't have to do any of the work. And full sun? Uh, I can take full sun. Nice. I mean, sometimes it's good to give it a little bit of afternoon shade, but it depends on the summer. Like last summer, you know, we had such a blasted hot summer right. that, that uh, they needed a little bit of protection. But uh, normal, under normal conditions, you can grow it in full sun. Wonderful. And then a broadleaf evergreen. That's beautiful. Yeah, this is Mahonia Soft Caress, which is a, uh, a nice different texture because of the kind of bamboo-like foliage. And it also blooms in early winter, which is, is unique because not a lot of things do. So it has a nice bright yellow flower in the, in the early winter. So uh, it's another good plant because we're really big on 12-month color. So Exactly. Yeah. And so you're talking about dwarf varieties here. And so they're just a little bit more expensive than their cousins. So why would that be? Well, because for instance, if I plant this perennial, this heuchera, once I plant it six to eight weeks later, I have a sellable plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, Harvard Gold, I'll have a sellable plant in five to six years. Uh. So dwarf conifers grow really slowly, so there's a lot more that goes into them. So yeah, they're a little more expensive, but you also have a 12-month uh, color, and you have a very unique plant that grows slowly that requires no maintenance. Uh. So. Well, not only do they have plants here at French Prairie Perennials, they have a beautiful gift shop. And I'm with Carrie. Mm -hmm. And what kind of things can we see here then? Well, we have um, nature-inspired gifts. Um, home decor, we have things like rain chains, we have things like um, um, metal spirals to go on walls for your fence so you don't have to look at a bare fence all summer. <laughs> um, we have uh, bird feeders, we have Quite, a, quite an assortment, actually. Oh, and then they have chocolate, they have gift cards, they have jewelry, <laughs> they have so many different things. You really can get lost here. Come on down to Aurora and see French Prairie Perennials. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks, Judy. Thank you for watching Garden Time today. We hope our gardens go from this to this very soon. So for more information and tips, please go to gardentime.tv. Ryan and I thank you for watching and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. Join Garden Time as we hit the road again. In September of 2022, we'll travel to Holland and Belgium. We'll visit the world famous Allsmere Flower Auction, Flora World, the University Gardens of Ghent, and the Japanese Gardens of The Hague. We'll also visit the once a decade Floriot Expo, the World's Fair of Gardening. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Ghent, The Hague, and Amsterdam on this wonderful tour. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.